hello and welcome to my floss tube channel. I'm Jean Farish and I am here to spend this time with you talking about all kinds of things that have to do with our favorite pastime needlework. So today we're going to talk about a lot of different things. We're going to talk about the next step in my great tablecloth restoration journey. I have some um, tips to share from your fellow viewers as well as some FAQs. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Orvis soap and how I divided it up and um, got that all all finished up. And I have a little bit of a design challenge with, once again, working with colors and trying to figure out which ones are going to play together well enough to make the final cut. And I had a wonderful day on a needlework lover's road trip, just a one day trip um, with two fabulous needlework professionals. And I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. But first the tablecloth. So the last time we talked, I had it um, all washed and began to stretch it out um, and found that I just did not have the dexterity or the strength to straighten it um, to my satisfaction. And you can see from these photos just how wavy those uh, side borders are. And I kind of felt like that that intricate detail kind of frames the whole thing and that really needs to be straight. Where the hem attaches, um, or, or I should say the top part of the hem where there's a little bit of a decorative stitch, it's not gonna show in the final framing. So that wasn't as critical to keep that straight as it was to keep that border straight. So um, I had my daughter Elizabeth help me and by each of us working on opposing sides, we were able to get it stretched fairly well. It's not perfect. And in fact, the, the big issue has to do with a little bit of waviness that you can see in the middle of, of the design. But like in all things in life, there are trade-offs. And with those tiny little holes appearing, I felt like that I really needed to ease up a little bit and, and not stretch it quite so strenuously as it would have taken to have gotten those last few little little wrinkles out. So these are the, the decisions I had to make as I'm going along. And, you know, very few stuff is really perfect. You just have to just kind of work with what you've got. So that's where we are with that. Um, well, actually, I also got another part of it done, and that's to start the sewing part, which is very, very tedious. So I set up my workstation so I could watch, um, rewatch, binge watch, once again, one of my favorite shows, Madam Secretary. So I've been um, kind of having that in the background while I'm sewing along. Since I've watch the series from front to back two or three times. I kind of know what what's coming, um, but it's just good company. So um, the next step, we'll be putting it back in the mat and the double-sided glass. So it'll be a sandwich where there'll be glass, the needlework, a decorative mat, another piece of glass, and the frame. And um, again, even if um, I had full use of my left hand, which I still don't, um, I would still need help. It's just very heavy and I need to make sure the glass is clean on both sides. And um, so I'll get help with that next week. And hopefully this time next Saturday, I'll be able to show it to you all framed. So I'm really excited about that. So that brings me to the other thing that I showed you last week with the Orvis soap. And um, I had it all divided up into little containers, but I had not put labels on it yet. And I will tell you that I'm kind of pleased with how it looks. And, um, but in getting the information, I basically took the information for the original label and created these labels uh, to print them. It kind of gave me a chance to review the properties of this soap and why I like it so much. So let me share a little bit of that with you. First of all, I often wondered why they called it WA Paste. And I found out that that stands for Water Activated. 
Um, the company has been in business since 1932. It's all made in the USA. And I decided just um, because I thought it was interesting to go ahead and put down what they say on the main label. Ideal for cleaning horses, livestock, pets, quilts, and delicate fabric. Um, so this is why I love this for doing needlework. It's residue-free, hypoallergenic, biodegradable, no phosphates, water-activated, which I already mentioned, bleach-free, and pH-neutral. Then I also thought um, it would be important to put what the ingredients are on my label since that's in the, in the main thing. So that's what I've done, and um, I'm just really pleased with how this whole project's turned out. And I hope that in some way or fashion, um, you try it with a, a group of friends. And, you know, with Christmas coming, for those who celebrate, it'd be a kind of nice stocking stuffer, just a little gift um, for those in your life that, that do need a work. So that's all I need to say about Orvis. I feel like a 1950s soap model. <laughs> so my road trip. Um... This was sort of planned and sort of not planned, but as those of you who watch um, Jan Hicks Creates um, know that she and her husband are traveling the USA in a camper trailer, with a camper trailer, and her path found her in Western North Carolina. It was about a two-hour drive for me to, to go pick her up at her campsite, but, you know, that's easy peasy. And I will tell you, the fall foliage was just perfect here in the Piedmont, North Carolina, where I live and on up into the mountains. So I, I was just really able to, to just relax and enjoy, enjoy that trip. So I picked Jan up and we went to Sassy Jacks. Now, again, for those of you who are following what's going on with Sassy Jacks, you know that some time ago, years ago, actually, she started when I say she, Kim, started um, restoring this wonderful old house and with the idea of it becoming her needle workshop. And there for a while, she had a sort of, you know, not really temporary, but sort of in that journey that she's taking, um, had her shop on Main Street in Weaverville. Wonderful shop. Um, and then has since closed that and does everything by mail order. But she and her husband have been um, diligently working to restore the space. And so Jan and I were given a tour of the space as it and the where it is right now, which is still very much not I can't say under construction as much as just well, anybody who's done any kind of historic re restoration, and I have done it twice myself, knows that it's it's just it's a process and there's equipment and there there are logistical decisions and um, decisions to make in terms of color. And the one thing I will tell you that about Kim and her approach to the shop, that as a shopper in the future, you're going to absolutely love, is how well planned out it is and how organized she is. Each one of the rooms will have a function. There will be a room that will be the thread room. There'll be a room that's um, for fabric. There's um, charts are all together. Um, there's gonna be um, just, it, it's just delightful. And and for the future, it won't be, the shop will be open before this happens. She's actually gonna have two rooms upstairs that people can stay there and, you know, just kind of have a little retreat. So I just really, um, admire Kim and the work that she's putting into the shop. And I'm, I, I took a, a bit of footage, a video footage while I was there. I'm not going to show that to you right now. I'm going to wait until the shop opens and then you'll really be able to see the before and after. Um, but it's just absolutely delightful. And, you know, besides her love of needlework, her, her, her passion for literature um, and just the preservation of culture will, will come through when when you go to visit the shop. So um, I know what you're thinking, when is she gonna open? And I don't have that magic answer, but uh, when she does, it's going to be a wonderful shop. 
So when we finished touring um, the future fa Sassy Jacks, um, Kim decided to come with us to our next stop, and that was to Annabella's. Um, now, we kind of took the long way going on our way to the shop just to enjoy just that whole mountain scenery and it was just it was just gorgeous we had a, a really pretty day to do this um so the three of us um toured annabella's and i was really really impressed with the shop it's just it's i don't know that nice combination of light and airy and cozy and um just again another well thought out space so for those of you who live a distance away um, once Sassy Jacks is open, I hope that you will get out your map and grab a couple of friends and ask yourself a couple of important questions. How many people can I fit in my vehicle and still have room for the stuff I'm going to buy and make a plan to come to Western North Carolina? Um, you will not be disappointed. It is just absolutely gorgeous. And while you're there, if you want to make a weekend of it, build more houses there um, which is just wonderful. There are great restaurants in the area. Asheville is, is, is worth a day of your time. Um, just a really, really wonderful place to be. So, um, you know, start thinking about that now because it won't be long before Satchi Jacks is open. I haven't talked a lot about the design that I'm working on right now um, because it's for the Floss Tube at Sea cruise in January. And um, Jan Hicks and Michelle from Michelle Bendy Stitchy uh, uh, and I are co-hosting that. And we kind of decided that we would keep our creative designs under wraps so it'll be kind of a big reveal when, when we get on the ship. But I thought I would show you just a little bit of it. Um, so the title is The Egret and the Dolphin. So that gives you an idea right there that our two main characters are going to be an egret and a dolphin. The dolphin was easy. I um, started with a base of colors using this uh, many of the same colors that I used in Two Turtles and a Flamingo and adopted those and then took some out, added some others to kind of continue with that um, warm tropical vibe and picked an appropriate verse that's going to go again with that tropical vibe and started from there and i you know when when i get done with the design process before i start stitching i'm usually pretty pleased with it i don't go on to the next stage until i've kind of worked out all the trouble spots or whatever so, um, but I always know that when I start stitching that I'm going to end up with some su surprises. So I, I knew I was okay with the dolphin. The egret, though, I started out with using some of those same warm colors. But, you know, an egret is more, you know, is pale. And I wanted to convey that. So this is what I came up with. Now this is just showing you um, a part of the design. Um, so once again, I have the silhouette of the egret that is then filled with this geometric pattern. And this is what I came up with and I was pretty happy with it. But then um, when I look back on it, compared to the dolphin, the egret was way too bland. And I and I had to challenge myself with this question. How realistic do I need to make this egret? I mean, I'm not, you know, taking this to the Audubon Society to be published. Um, it's not from the National Geographic cover. So it's okay if it's not pale. So this is what I came up with. Okay, so this is what I had first, and then I took those blues out and replaced them with pinks, and I'm really, really pleased with it. Now, all this area that's blank in between this motif will also get filled in. Um, but for that, I had to test what I was going to, kind of my filler col color. 
And I, there's actually, believe it or not, in here, three different pale yellows that I was testing to see which one I liked best. So again, that's the process that I use when, when I am designing something. I, you know, it's computer generated, cross stitch designs are wonderful. Um, I can work so much faster than I could back in the day when I started with colored pencils or, you know, had to do everything hand drawn. But there's nothing like actually stitching it and seeing how the colors work together. And um, it's just a critical step. There's no avoiding it. And I don't think I've ever had a design that didn't require some adjustment in the colors once I got to the stitching stage. So that's where I am with the egret. And um, because I'm stitching so slowly, I am getting a friend to, um, I'm gonna stitch one myself and, and have somebody else stitch another one that way I know for sure in January, one of them will be done. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and in that Floss Tube at Sea cruise, we are not having um, what I consider a traditional class. When I teach, I teach usually 24 people at a time, which allows me to demonstrate a stitch, talk about it, and then I have time to go around and see each person individually and, and see if anybody has any questions, um, kind of troubleshoot, um, just do, do what teachers do. But we're gonna have 70 some people at a time. And so I'm really calling it more of a presentation. And we'll, I'll, still, I'll demonstrate the stitch and I will come around and help people as much as I can and Jan and Michelle will be there during the time I'm doing my presentation, so they will help out as well. And then I'll do the same thing for them. So there'll always be three of us. Um, so when you do the math, I'm still, you know, working with 25 or so people at a time and, you know, with their help dividing that, that crowd up. So I think it's gonna work really well. We're, we, are, we are so excited about it. Um, not to minimize the holidays coming up and time with family and friends, but man, that January 14th date on the horizon is just really, um, I'm just really excited about it. So um, we're planning games. Um, it's just gonna be very different from the cruises we've done before. Um, the, the Stitchers Escapes cruises generally, and we have classes, but it's a, it's a lot of, it's very itinerary driven. We have always taken our cruises to places um, where we can s visit cities that many of us have never been to and um, do some activities on shore that, you know, we might never have another chance to, to do. But the Floss Tube at Sea Cruise will truly be more like a floating retreat, except that it'll be seven days long um, and all the food is, uh, is provided for and it's excellent quality and there'll be nighttime entertainment and, but I think the bonding and the, um, just spending that time with your tribe will, will really be there. So it's, 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 it's going to be exciting. And we've, we already have plans and dates for 2025. So if you, um, you know, if you've been following along and you're interested, then again, I just really encourage you to get on the Stitchers Escapes website, stitchersescapes.com and sign up, subscribe to our newsletter because those are the people that get the information first. And um, yeah, yeah, so that's gonna be really good. It'll be in January again, it'll be a week later. Don't remember the dates exactly, but I wanna say, it's like this year, it's the 14th to the 21st, and next year, it's like the 20 something to whatever. So, um, yeah, that's gonna be good. Okay, what's next? I love reading the comments that people leave, and, uh, and I hope that you don't ever hesitate to, to leave questions or tips or just, hey, how are you doing sort of comments. This came from a viewer by the name of Deborah. She said, I love over-dyed floss, but it's not without its challenges. 
I have learned to pull out the number of strands I will be stitching with and lay them on my fabric and with the other colors of floss before deciding whether to go with a called for floss. The colors can look remarkably different with less strands. It is particularly important if you have had to change or substitute for the original fabric and more so if the fabric is hand dyed. Now, um, was it last week or the week before I talked about a friend of mine really having just a real disappointment with a project because the one thing that Deborah hasn't mentioned there that because she was really commenting on this other episode where we talked about the fact that with most over dyes, the dye lot can change dramatically. So the called for color, when you look at the photograph, what that designer stitched with to stitch that model could be very different from what you get in the shop on any particular day. It's nobody's fault. It's just, it's just the nature of the beast. So with that in mind, Deborah's point really hit home with me. And this is something I do all the time. And it just never occurred to me to share the tip with you. So I am really glad that she wrote about that. So let me just demonstrate a little bit. Now this is not over dyed, but it's a variegated. Let me see if I can get the light on here a little bit better. Um, this is Cosmo 8017. And it, um, the colors range from like a pale olive green to a very definite taupe to kind of an, a pale taupe, almost ecru in there. So when you lay that on your fabric, and I, I pulled several colors out here, you are seeing the density of the whole scan of floss. At any given time, I mean, you're seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You're seeing about 15 times six strands. That's what your eye is seeing, and you're seeing all these different colors. So Deborah's point is so valid. What you need to do is pull out a length. So you are, now, and that's just, that's looking at the, the six strands. Let's pull out just two strands. Now granted, this is my floss. Um, you'll be in a shop and you haven't bought it yet. So I don't, you know, I don't know how comfortable you'll feel with that. But you can see how different the impression is when you're looking at just two strands compared to like a whole skein. So do that and make sure, like, and again, I really hope the camera's picking this up. Um, let me reconstruct that a little bit. Um, so it's going from, uh, like I say, a light olive green to a taupe. So you really have to look at, um, with over dyes, not just um, a, a, a strip of six strand and see what colors are in there, but also divide that out and look at the two strands. And again, I realize the logistics of doing that in a shop when you have not yet bought the skein may not really work well, but before you start stitching, even if it means that you end up saying, hmm, that's not the skein for me, let me buy something else, that's better than going home without the right color, and certainly better than spending 20 hours stitching and then finding that it's not looking the way you want it to look. So, you know, take your time. You know, I, I love, one of the things I love about counter cross stitch is how instant it is. You can sit down and just get right to work. Unlike other things I've done in my life, like say pottery, there's just, you know, it's just a lot of prep work or even baking, which I love to do is getting all that stuff out and everything. But if you've got your little cross stitch nest set up, then you just can sit down and just start stitching and that's wonderful. But when you're changing colors or you have questions about um, whether or not these are the right colors, and again, especially if you're using over dyes because of the dye lots changing, um, you owe it to yourself to just take a breath and say, you know what, an hour spent doing this 
is far less time than the time if I had to stitch and unstitch and restitch because I didn't make the right color choice. So take your time and do it right. I got a great question from Cynthia. She said, does it matter where the sewage side of the fabric is placed in cross-stitching? Can it be at the top of the piece or must it be on the side? Now, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about here, let me grab this piece of fabric here. Um, this is Victoria's, no, Mariner's Map, I think. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, so this is what we call the selvage. And the selvage, actually, when, when the piece is woven, it's, it's on the side. So basically what happens is the shuttle is taking these weaving fibers over, making a U-turn and going back, creating a selvage on the other side. I forgot to start my camera. Okay, so selvage. Um, so it's created because the um, weaving threads are taken over, make a U-turn, go back back and forth and back and forth. So every time they're turning, you, you're, it's creating a selvage, which does not fray, you know, unlike the cut edge. So that is um, a weaving term. And fabric that is loomed all has selvage. Now, as I told Cynthia and the answer, my answer to her, this question sparks a lot of debates among cross-stitchers. Now, again, all woven fabric has selvage, and the importance of that selvage depends on the fabric and what you're doing with it. If you are doing clothing construction, where that selvage is is important because um, parallel to the selvage is what we call the grain of the fabric. If you turn the fabric 45 degrees, that's the bias. And for example, if you were making a skirt that you wanted to drape and flow, you would want to cut it on the bias. Um, if you were making a pair of trousers, the last thing in the world you want is to cut it on the bias because when you sit down at a concert or a basketball game or to eat dinner, when you got up, the seat of those pants would be awfully baggy because the bias has give. Uh, which again, you want if you want something drapey and flowy. If you were using fabric for upholstery, the grain of the fabric, again, is really important. Um, for strength, the, the fabric behaves differently with the threads going this way than it does the threads going this way. So the weavers, for people who are doing dress design and dress construction, upholstery, selvage is absolutely critical. So it's not fair to say selvage doesn't matter. But Cynthia's question is, does it matter to a cross-stitcher? And to that, I want to say, I don't think so. Again, this is a big debate across, across professionals and across people who are passionate about our needlework. Fabric that's woven for counted cross stitch, the weavers are striving for an even weave. They want the same number of threads, quality, density, going this way or going this way. I have read all kinds of commentary from people that swear that they can pick up any piece of fabric with the selvage cut off and they can tell you where the selvage originally was. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna even come close to wondering whether or not that's possible. What I wanna say to you as a cross-stitcher is I don't think it matters. It doesn't matter in terms of the pleasure of stitching. It doesn't matter as far as the construction of your stitches. It doesn't matter as far as the end result. And to me, the end result and your joy of stitching are the things that matter. So if you have a piece of fabric that the selvage is here, let's say if you have a rectangle and the selvage is here, but you need a piece that's this way, it's okay if that selvage is at the top. 
again, that's my opinion and my practice. Um, that said, when I cut fabric for a class, I am careful to cut it so the sewage is always on the sides. Now, frankly, sometimes that wastes fabric because again, the efficient cut may be to cut this way. Um, but out of respect for my students who feel that it is critical, I made that professional decision years ago and I have kept to it. Um, so, but if I'm cutting a piece of fabric for my own personal use, or even professionally, just it's the models that I use, I don't care which way it goes. The one thing I will say that I've learned is when you go to frame a piece or do any kind of finishing that requires stretching the fabric, do cut the selvage off, especially if you have a piece cut, and most of us do, where the selvage is on one side and the other parallel side is pre-cut. Cut that selvage off because the selvage keeps the fabric from stretching. And although you, in my opinion, again, you don't want to overstretch fabric when you are uh, stretching it for pinning, um, for finishing, for framing, you don't ever want to overstretch it, but the selvage side will behave differently than the cut side. And so for you to have consistency, go ahead and cut that selvage off when it's time to go finishing. In terms of the selvage being attached while you're stitching, it makes no difference. And to me, it's just a little time saver that the selvage size, you don't need to zigzag it, you don't need to surge it, you don't need to put fray check on it. And, you know, you can just, you know, go with it. So anyway, um, long answer to <laughs> Cynthia's short question. As usual, I can go on and on about this stuff, but that's what I have to say about selvage. Now, if you have a tip that you would love to share with other stitchers um, or a question uh, of anything stitch related, then um, please do leave it in the comments. I do read them all every day. I don't always take the time to respond to everybody's comment, although I, I try to do that more than not. Um, but I decided that that's kind of a fun thing to be able to share. And again, I think it just builds this community to connect. Um, and maybe you're sitting there saying, oh yeah, I do that. Or, oh, that's a great idea. And either one of those responses is wonderful. And I hope that you will share your tips and your questions as well. So um, until next week, stitch happy, stay safe, and I'll see you then.